much to leadership uh, in higher education, a woman's perspective. I'm Dr. Victoria Seitz, and I want to kick it off to my colleague, Dr. Francesca Baer, for this great event. Francesca? Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Seid and the ladies. As I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, we are so thankful that you took the time to be here and share with us. Uh, just seeing you a couple of minutes, <laughs> as I said, I will be leaving, but just, um, it, it's, it's really inspiring. It's really inspiring and recognizing, you know, some of you even more. So since I have a couple of minutes, uh, I would like to share with you a couple of slides um, about the Office of Academic Equity. And then a couple of uh, information I found on your webpage, which I thought could be uh, it's a good, good time, I thought, for me to mention that. So allow me to just quickly share my screen. And here we have. So you will please tell me if you can see uh, my screen. And I believe it's OK. So this event is put, been put together by the uh, GHBC Office of Academic Equity and the WLC. So a couple of words about the Office of Academic Equity. I would like to invite you, since time is short, to visit our webpage, which is located at csusb.edu academic equity, quite easy. And I think that you will agree with us that over the course of the last two years, because the office is very, very new, just two years, we have been able to achieve a, a part of our mission. I was going to say a lot of things, but you know, talking about equity, diversity, inclusion, it's never enough anyway. So we're always you know, in the right direction, making progress, but we, we are making progress. So I invite you to watch, you know, check our webpage and you will see what you, we have been able to do. Uh, you will also, you also invited to check our fact sheet, which is uh, presented on the webpage. And uh, we are really uh, happy that we have the support of the faculty, the student, the dean, to be able to put together the event that we have been able to create. We have a sea economy, we have some trendsetters, we have voice series, we have some advocate. So we have made substantial progress with the office and uh, we will continue doing so. Since I have a minute, I would also like to invite you to attend our next event, which is May the 3rd. It is the anti-Asian racism event. We are really, really um, trying to just take very clear stands and make it clear to the campus community, to the community at large, to our students, how we stand, you know, and what it really means to be the leader of tomorrow. So this is, you know, a good event for a student to uh, attend that. Then, of course, today, you are our inspiring leader. So after uh, Victor and I talk about the, this uh, group of panelists, I devoted a little bit of time, not, not a lot, a little bit of time to just visit the webpage of every single one of you. And I found some fantastic thing, which I would like to share with everybody. Very, very short. So the first thing I wanted to share is a quote from uh, Dr. Dirac. On her webpage, on the uh, university college webpage, I read, welcoming all types of diversity and leveraging the individual talents of all students and faculty is a critical component inherent in all world-class business school. And after a quote, I noticed that when student has recorded a video and the video, the title of this video is, I belong. So if that is not inspiring, you tell me. Then I went, of course, to the webpage of uh, Dr. Papazian. And here's what Dr. Papazian said. Together, we are brilliant. Our mission is to create opportunities for students who don't otherwise have them and to allow students to soar. Again, I, I 
Okay, I was really inspired by that. We have to continue and be clear with our student and everybody around us that yes, it's through a community, right? Or effort of together that we will be successful. And there is plenty of evidence to just show that, but we still have to hear it. And then of course, I went on the webpage of Dr. Shell. Oops, I'm sorry. And there I read a better future. Although we cannot change history, we have the power to build a better future in which everyone is treated with respect and receives the same opportunity regardless of race or ethnicity. I mentioned briefly, Dr. Scheidt was uh, my chair and she was already at that time, you know, pushing and working so hard to just instill this type of philosophy. So what do I wanna say? And what I wanna say that Yes, we are brilliant, we belong, and we are creating together a better future. So ladies, thank you so very, very much for giving me the opportunity to welcome you to this event. It's really my honor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francesca, for such lovely words. Let me share my screen. Oh, I cannot change, okay, great. Thank you. That was lovely. Fantastic. That really was, Thank wasn't you. it? Wow. Woo. <laughs> oh, to be inspired. And, you know, what a great way to kick off this event. But, and I, I wanted to share as we shift into higher education and diversity, um, I wanted to share some statistics that, um, that I got. Um, and basically, um, women in academia make up more than half of all college students, but only slightly more than a quarter of all full professors and less than 15% of presidents. Across academic and across institution types, male professors still make about 20 grand more than females. And male assistant professors make an average of 87,000 compared to 79,000 made by females. Women have earned more than 50% of all doctoral degrees since 2006. And as of 2015, women held 32% of the full, a full professor positions at degree granting post-secondary institution, only 32%. As far as administration, women presidents are likely to less likely to be married, less likely to have children, and more likely to alter to have altered their career to care for dependents, spouse, partner, or parent. And women presidents are more likely to have a PhD or EDD than their male peers. Mm. Thank you, Astrid. Women presidents are more likely to have served as chief, chief academic officer or provost or other senior executive in academic affairs, while male presidents are more likely to come from the outside of higher education. As of 2016, women only held 30% of presidencies across all institutions of higher education, and only 8% of women presidents leading, are leading doctoral granting institutions. And then we have, to kick it off, 78% of women presidents are serving their first presidency. So we have a state where we need to work and be inspired to make a difference in higher education. <clears throat> and so let's uh, kick it off and start with our first panelist. And we'll be entertaining questions later. But let's hear the stories from our panelists. And we'll start with first, Dr. Jenny Derrick. Dean of the Farmer School of Business, Miami University, Ohio. And prior to joining Miami University, Derek served as the Dean of the Peter F. Drucker and Masatoshi Ito Graduate School of Management at Claremont Graduate University. She earned her doctorate in marketing from the University of Otago in New Zealand. Dr. Derek, would you spend some time with us and share your story? 
Well, firstly, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to this group. It's a privilege and pleasure to be here. So I've prepared some sound bites for you. I'm going to take you through my journey. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what prompted me to get into leadership roles, um, pursuing goals toward deanship, and there's some interesting stories around that, some lessons learned along the way, and then some of the pitfalls and delights. So they're the prompts that I'll be working with. So let me begin with a very potted history of my journey that led me to the career that I've got. I'm going to break it into uh, four parts, and there's an unknown fifth part. There's more to come, but I'll just tell you about the four parts that have been. So firstly, I, I started my career in corporate New Zealand. So as you figured out, you are listening to a Kiwi, a New Zealand accent. I'm not Australian, not South African, not English. I'm a Kiwi from New Zealand. Um, but I started off in corporate New Zealand working in marketing. And I spent four years running a family supply chain consulting business, which is in and of itself is an interesting story. In fact, I laugh about that then because I was helping my father run an engineering consulting business and I had a whole bunch of male engineers that I was helping lead. And I don't think I actually really knew what I was doing. So <laughs> anyway, moving on from that. Um, but I found my way back into university roles and eventually completed of my master's degree at Auckland University in marketing and international business. So the beginning of my higher education career was mostly in New Zealand, although I did go to Dubai for a couple of years and worked in a, um, a, a, a woman's uh, post-secondary post uh, institution. I think when I look back over my time in New Zealand, there are two things that I'm most proud about. Uh, one, that I led the entrepreneurship program at the University of Otago, and I launched our first master's degree in entrepreneurship, uh, set up an incubator, endowed a chair in entrepreneurship, and it was just a fantastic opportunity and a great city to be part of. And then also I ran the marketing component of Massey University's MBA, where Larry Rose, my good friend, has come from. And uh, that was a really big program. It still is. And it was taught out of about five or six locations. But I was the marketing lead. The third part of my career is moving to the States. So in 2004, I decided to come to the States. And through q and I can elaborate on any of these points if they're of interest. And brought with me my husband and two boys who were then fourth and sixth grade to the States and joined Claremont Graduate University, in, in particular the Drucker School. Sometimes I don't know why you make some of the decisions, but one thing I still kick myself over was I allowed CGU to, to set my tenure clock back to zero. So I was already a director of entrepreneurship, uh, an associate professor with tenure in New Zealand, and I went right back to being an assistant professor and working my way back up through a very different system. But I did it, and, and again, I can elaborate of, of any interest, but I got tenure, worked my way up where I was the dean for four years, nearly four years before I left. And that was an interesting experience. And, and I pat myself on the back for showing resilience and being able to adapt and, and do well in a completely different structure, a different country, a different education system to that which I was familiar. But I, you know, the, the next part of the story is the move here to Oxford, Ohio. So I was at the Drucker School for 16 years, four of which were, in, uh, were Dean and three of which were MBA Associate Dean. So I had quite a, a good run there. And I could have stayed there for 16 more years. And you know, we, have, we had a lovely home in, in Clareboy in Claremont up in the foothills. We had a good lifestyle there. We had great friends. We knew how to get to Costco, where Lowe's was. We had a doctor, a dentist, you know, all of those things. But I, I knew that I wanted to do something else and I needed to move on. And so I put myself on the job market and I was quite particular in terms of what I was looking for. But I ended up landing here at the Pharma School in Oxford, Ohio, not at Miami University, but not in Florida. It's the other one. <laughs> so there are two of them. And to take up another deanship, this time at the Pharma School. And, you know, it was an interesting time to move. This has all been done through COVID. And in fact, tomorrow, I have my first face-to-face -face meeting with my provost, whom I have not seen since I interviewed for the job in February. So I'm about to see him for the first time face-to-face. -face. So I'm, I'm sitting here upstairs in the upstairs bedroom. I've been running a school that I barely know and from a physical point of view uh, for, for nearly a year and we've done quite well. We've moved up in the rankings. We've got a 20% increase 
an incoming class this this year. So we, we've got some great statistics to be proud of, and I can speak more of that. But certainly moving through a pandemic was testing and trying. I mean, the pandemic has tested all of us, but I certainly found uh, selling a house, moving, taking up a new role, uh, learning a new school, and still not only have I not met my provost, but there's quite a few of my senior team that I haven't met face to face. So, you know, I, I think about um, a, a lot of this issue of, of leadership and positions of leadership. And I think, you know, I don't need to remind this group that leadership is all about how we use our social influence and how we call upon others and enlist the, the, the help of others to accomplish a common task. And I think I've always done that right the way through my career. I've, I've gravitated toward positions of leadership. But the key difference now is I hold titles that, that have some kind of positional uh, leadership in, in the title, if you will. So it, you know, with title comes obviously responsibility, final decision rights, and as I say, the responsibility for the success of the school. And But I wouldn't be successful if I didn't bring the people along with me and let people own their decisions, even though I might ultimately have to make them. I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. And I think in university settings, you know, we're a strange industry for people who don't know us. It's a pretty strange industry to explain. Faculty governance is an incredibly complicated concept for people to, to understand. But you know, if, if, as a dean, if I don't have the support of faculty, then I'm not successful. And, and it's something I'm, I'm mindful of all the time. So as I said, I, I, you know, why have I gravitated toward positions of leadership? I often think about that too. And I think of strategy as following a three-part cadence. Part one is setting a vision or a strategic direction. Part two is turning that vision into a plan. And then part three is implementing the plan. And I think when you're in positions of leadership, especially as dean or a CEO or president of university, you spend a lot more time setting the strategic direction for the organization, sharing in the planning as part of the handoff and others around you implement. So for me, when I think about why is it that I often end up in these positions, um, I, I think that I've always had quite a good read of market. I've always, maybe it's because I've, I'm marketing trained, so somehow I found the right career. <laughs> um, so I've always had a good read of market and I've always felt I've had a good sense of what needs to be done, you know, how the organization should position itself in the, in, in the market, you know, a good sense of what the problems are that I'm trying to solve. And I'm really good at aligning people to, to work toward that vision. So I think that might explain why I've often gravitated toward these positions, because as I've said, I, I um, I, I just, I find it, it, it's not, I mean, it, it just comes easier. And I think the flip side of that, I often watch people in positions of leadership who are above me. I, I think to myself, I could be doing this. I could, I, 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 I could do this. I could, you know, that was certainly what motivated me at the beginning was just realizing that I could do just as equally as well. So moving on to another theme uh, that I want to speak about is the, the goal of becoming Dean. And I have to be perfectly honest, when I started out, earlier on in my career, I don't think I was very strategic at all with respect to my, my career. And I've got two boys in their 20s, and we call the 20s the trying 20s. And I think it's the trying 20s because we just simply try a lot of different things out. And I think that's probably true. But now I am a lot more strategic. As I said, when I was younger, I jumped around a bit and, and you know, tried to figure out what I wanted to, to do. I, you know, I, I've already shared the different parts of that. And I ended up in higher education. I've already said that I decided you know, I wanted to take a run at Dean, but it took me four years, actually. It was four years before I had the opportunity. So I, I pushed, and, and in fact, one data point that's important there, I was a bit stuck at Drucker for a little while because I had a, a, a son at college and that kept me bound to Claremont because he was at Pitsa College. And I know that with the data that Vic, Victoria shared, a lot of women are not as mobile for different reasons as men. And that was certainly true of me when I was raising kids, had them in high school, had them in uh, college. I didn't feel that I had the same level of mobility. But having said that, for about four years, I was waiting on the sidelines, waiting for an opportunity to come. And finally, I was appointed to Dean in 2016. <laughs> so I had to do the math on that. Um, and I loved the role. But as I said, after four years, I decided it was time to move. 
And I thought that I want, I, I still believe that a different context was the right thing for my professional growth. And I say that because if you knew, if you know the Drucker School, you know, and Claremont, you know, they're very small private liberal arts colleges and, and, and graduate only, what's more is where I was working. And I don't know what the future holds, but if I do choose to go back to New Zealand to work, and it may be something I do, all of the universities, there are large public uh, comprehensive universities, and I just felt I needed to do something else, a different context to test out my leadership style in a different place. So I think it was, a, for me, that was the important choice to make. So now I want to just share some, some sound bites around leadership and, and my thoughts around leadership. So I, I cannot help myself but start with some Draca content. And I know that you live down the road from the Draca School. I was the dean of the Draca School. But his research really did inform my leadership. And I didn't really know his work as well as I do now, of course. But there are a couple of things that I want to share. Because as I said, I was the dean there for four years. He characterized an effective leader as someone who nurtures and articulates a shared set of values, provides people with status and function and a sense of community and purpose, and ultimately believes that people will self-direct and self-regulate to get things done. Now, I included that, that point of view from Drucker because I think COVID has put a spotlight on the need for people to be self-directed and self-regulated. It also has put a spotlight on the need for community and purpose, and our communities, higher education institutions, are places where people do flourish, where people learn and grow, and where they further realize their potential. So I, I do pause and reflect on the importance of our role as leaders in higher education right now. As we enter a post-COVID world, I think it's on us as leaders to enable and ensure that this remains true. My second soundbite or thought about leadership is, all, again, it's a Drucker one, I, I'm sort of apologizing, not really, but Drucker you know, advocated for us to think about what is our contribution. And he talked a lot about what your contribution is, and he asks us to ask questions of ourselves. Firstly, what, what should my contribution be? Secondly, what does the situation require? Thirdly, how can I best contribute? And fourth, what re results do I need to achieve in order to make a difference? So I actually hold on to those questions quite a lot for myself. And sometimes in these roles, it's really easy to get lost. And, and for me, it's been COVID and budget and AACSB accreditation. It's been a really, a, 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 you know, a lot of stuff goes on in a day. But sometimes when I get lost, I actually pull myself back to those questions. And I ask myself right now, what should my contribution be to, you know, based on where the organizations are at right now? And I, and I actually just did that over the weekend and I allowed myself to refocus on some priority areas. And equally, I asked the same with my direct reports and that's how I, I lead is get people to focus on their contribution and what will their contribution be to allow us to move the needle. The, the, the next point I want to make is around faculty governance. And I talk about the three month echo. So I did mention faculty governance at the beginning and how important it is and how it makes or breaks our, our roles as, as leaders in higher education. But it's something that I learned quickly and I'm very mindful of. So if you remember, I said to you before that I, I am quite a quick read of market and I, I have things figured out quite quickly, but I've learned that that's a massively bad thing to, to disclose. And, and I say that because ultimately people have to own the decisions that they're going to be implementing. So And so there are many times I can think of, um, even when we redesigned the Drucker MBA when I was back there, that I'd sort of push ideas out, then I'd pause and have a little, and, and sort of rework things behind the scenes, but with faculty involved. And three months later, it would take three months for the echo to come back faculty would come and present something to me that they were owning, but it was not that much different to how we started out, but, but that, you know, that's how we would get things done. Another point I'd like to make is the need to surround yourselves with people that you can talk to, that you can seek guidance from. And I know my very dear friend Larry Rose is on this call, and Larry, we go back about 100 years, I think. Sometimes it feels like that, but we've known each other since I think 1996, we figured out when you were back in New Zealand. And, and Larry is somebody, and I'm not just saying this to be nice because it's, but you know Larry and you love Larry too. But Larry is someone I've often gone to for guidance and counsel at different stages of my career. And he's been there for me. And, and Larry's just been a constant 
mentor throughout my career. And I'd also like to give a shout out to another group um, that I belong to. And, and we've got two women's groups within AACSB that have been incredibly important to me. One of which, or in fact, both of them, Astrid, you're, you're involved and we often hang out together at these different women's groups where we can just simply share and, and, and uh, confer about issues. A couple more, more points to make before I'll pass the microphone to the next person. People often say to me, I'm, I'm, I'm quite modest about what I do. I just get on and get things done. And they'll say to me things like, thank you for your leadership. And I, I usually stop and I go, whoa, 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 whoa. What are they talking about? Like, what am I doing? Like, what am I doing that's worthy of thank you? And I, I think about then just what do they mean? And, and I think about what do I do? What, how do I behave that might bring people to say, thank you for your leadership? Firstly, I simply model the behavior I expect of others. I'm really particular about showing up well and 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 I've got you know modeling behavior I expect others to follow and and that sets the tone that sets the culture for the organization you know and also I also I truly believe that we all have different leadership styles so what works for me might not work for anyone else uh, that you'll hear from tonight or anyone else but for me how do I lead I'm very recluse uh, recluse I'm actually not recluse I'm like <laughs> I'm inclusive. Um, I'm very respectful of other people's points of view. I'm very thoughtful. I make data-driven decisions, so I won't jump and knee-jerk my way into a decision. I actually pause and, and try and figure out what the heck's going on. I constantly thank people for their contributions. I express gratitude a lot, and I have fun. And in fact, most days I'll dissolve in fits of laughter about something. There'll be something that makes me laugh. When we're back face-to-face, -face, my office is the, the place where we have meetings there'll be you know, peals of laughter coming from, from meetings. And, and I just think that's really important from a, a leadership point of view, but also that people feel that they can trust enough to joke, to share, to, to, to mess up, to laugh about it and to move on. As I've already mentioned, I'm very thoughtful with, with respect to making decisions, but I do make sure that I've got good evidence behind what I do. And I will make decisions. Sometimes by being thoughtful, it can appear that you're not making a decision quick enough, but I will make decisions and I'm quite decisive when I have to be. Uh, I take the, the view, maybe it's a bit naive, that people around me are good and that we're all trying to live a life to, to try and find meaning and purpose and that work is a big contributor to this. So us as leaders of organisations have quite a responsibility to others and for their, their, their well, health and wellness. As, as kind and, 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 and respectful as I am, I do hold people accountable. I'm, I'm very clear about what I, you know, we set together, people tell me what their results are going to be, and then we hold, you know, they're held accountable for those. And I think ultimately, I think people just simply trust me and I get things done. So my, la my last little bucket of comments, um, I was asked to speak on pitfalls and delights around leadership. I think um, for me, the hardest thing would have to be finding some kind of balance between work and life and making sure that I, I give myself permission to take time off. So that probably is the hardest thing because I do take my job seriously. I am responsible for the school and its results, but I do take time off. I'm not saying that I don't. And, and in fact, I, I do, but it's probably the hardest thing I've had to do. I think the biggest delights for me would be watching people flourish. I just, as I walked into the the farmer's school and you look at the plate of you know the suite of people you've been given and some people had, had had a rough time with different working relationships and and now I've got a team around me who's just really um just just flourishing and, and it just brings me a lot of joy to to look at how I've been able to enable people to contribute and and really shine in their roles and, and take ownership for that I've had to to replace two associate deans since I joined pharma I remember I've just been there for um, less than a year. And in both cases, I could promote within and from within, I could bring in chairs. And, and it's been really wonderful for me watching people move up to these two roles of associate uh, dean and then watching two new chairs coming underneath. It's just been joyful. And, and just you know, there's that point where you bring them in, you, gu you watch, you guide, and then you sort of pull back and, and just drop in when you need to. So I, I think my final statement before I pass the microphone away is I consider a good day is when we all laugh together. For me, that's probably the most important thing. So thank you for listening. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Derek. I really appreciate it. Those are really outstanding words. 
We're going to take questions at the end. Um, we'll have sufficient time to do so. Thank you so much. I, please do take a, a drink of water. Um, <laughs> that was really good of you. I know I took a couple of drinks. Um, <clears throat> thank you so very, very much. Um, I'd like to introduce our next guest and uh, speaker, uh, President Dr. Mary, Ann, uh, Mary A. Papa, uh, Papa Zion. Papa Zion, president, she's president of San Jose State University. And Mary is also the professor of English at San Jose State. And since arriving there in 2016, uh, since 2016, Dr. Papazon has remained focused on strengthening communication among campus leaders, students, faculty, and staff. She has been energizing alumni, supporters, and friends of the university, as well as elevating engagement with elected industry and community leaders on important regional policy issues such as affordable housing, transportation, and economic opportunity that are critically relevant to an urban university. President Papa Zion received her BA, MA, and PhD in English literature from UCLA. Thank you and welcome President Papa Zion. Well, well, thank you, Victoria, and, um, and thank you to all the organizers, everybody who helped. Um, Jenny, thank you for your story. Uh, there's a lot of wisdom in what uh, you shared, and I'll be repeating some of it, um, sharing a few, you know, stories from just, you know, that uh, kind of illustrate what sometimes these paths feel like, and, and then highlight a few, um, hopefully, uh, welcome comments that um, will give you a way to think, each of you, uh, about your own leadership pathway. So, so I'm a professor of English. Um, I didn't start out as a professor of English. I started out as a sister with three brothers and uh, was never treated differently in my family. It was, uh, we were all the same age. I mean, we really weren't, but um, we might as well have been. And um, you, know, you just learn how to, to find your voice when you're with uh, kind of a you know wild family like mine. And so that was really, I think, really important for me because having found my voice in that space growing up, it gave me the confidence to find my voice in those kinds of spaces as I went through my career. And so, so I think we each come from different places and different experiences, but a lot of who we are and, and the, the kind of style we have or our comfort level really does come from, from very early experiences in our lives. And um, I'm really not sure what direction I wanted to go. I was in college, I thought law, I thought English. Uh, I ultimately fell in love with John Milton and decided I would rather read Paradise Lost than uh, do torts. And so I threw all the law school applications away. Um, and as I was applying to graduate to uh, professorships, my uh, faculty advisor wrote that letter. They always write about how, what a great college she'll be and her scholarship is so important and great in the classroom and all those things. And then he dropped this little line in the last paragraph. And he said, and by the way, she'll be a university president in 25 years. And I remember looking at him and saying, what are you talking about? He said, you know, he said but you have to make one promise. He said, you need to make sure you're a full professor first. So, you know, don't even think about it. Don't think about these kinds of things until you have that because in the academy, if you're going through the academic route, you really have to have those credentials. And for a lot of women, this actually is an issue. It's, it's a lot of women do get stuck at the associate professor level. They take on more and more responsibility and it's actually a real issue. And those of us in leadership have to think about ways to support women through those periods, it's women and it's, it's faculty of color as well who, who also run into this challenge. And so that was always in the back of my mind. I didn't realize it was there. I just focused on my work. I moved to Michigan from Southern California and uh, jumped in um, and, uh, and did my work in the English department at Oakland University. Um, what's really interesting though, is people did see some leadership in me and uh, I had a great department. They were really supportive. My academic work was going well. And there was time for, I, I was tenured now, and there was time for a um, uh, appointment of a new chair. And so this I share with you because as women, we will run against, up against, a, you know, 
surprises along the way. And just know that for all of us, whatever roles we're in, we have had those surprises. And I'm perfectly happy, you know, to kind of bear some of them with you so you can see. Um, so I was uh, one of the people who was strongly supported by the department and one of my colleagues who was a good friend, our kids played together, was the other. And he came into my office one day and he said, you know, Mary, I'm getting, uh, you know, encouragement to be put my name in, but I know you are. And I said, Brian, his name is Brian. I said, look, you're, you're be a terrific chair. Um, people think I will. Let's just put our names in and whoever it is, you know, we'll support each other and, um, and it'll all be good. Well, the dean couldn't make a decision. And it's really important when you're in leadership to know that at some point you have to make a decision. Well, ultimately what happened is in ways that quickly were not terribly gracious, um, you learn more from what you don't like, how people do things than sometimes um, what does work well. Um, he was afraid to tell me that he was gonna go with, with my colleague. Um, well, all he had to do was tell me it's his right to make the decision. So I go in there and what he says instead is that the senior colleague in the department came in and said, he needs it more than you. And this was because his wife wasn't working, he had, you know, and my husband was, and it was a very gendered response. And it wasn't about who did I think would be better in the role as chair, uh, which would have been a perfectly legitimate, you know, point. So I said, thank you for telling me. Um, does that really belong in this conversation? And um, sort of left. And um, and well, it was fine. He was a good chair. Um, but here's the point. Things like that will happen. What we have to decide is how we're going to respond to it. I could have been upset by it. I could have let it, you know, say, you know, that really wasn't fair. And I didn't like it from the point of how women are treated in the academy or anywhere else. So that, that's a different question. But for me personally, it was, okay, so where do I go from here? And one of my senior women colleagues pulled me into her office and said, Mary, she said, you're going to have other opportunities and um, you're going to do amazing work. So don't even think twice about it. You're going to be fine. And I remembered that because when a senior mentor said something like that to you when you're, you've are you just gone through something, it really means a lot. And I tried to remember that as my career developed to make sure that when somebody was going through something or a disappointment, that I was there to offer that kind of word, male or female. But it was really important that we be there for each other. And that means at whatever point we are in our careers. And so I was invited in to be, uh, to, to, be the editor of the tenure accreditation and to be co-director co of that part, that initiative for the university. And actually that's really what launched my administrative career. And uh, because it exposed me to the entire university, academic and non-academic, and it made a huge difference in my global understanding of how all the parts fit together. And because of that, the same dean, who was still a friend, wanted me to come into his um, college. It was the College of Arts and Sciences, the largest college as uh, an associate dean. And I said, fine, but I couldn't do it until after I delivered the um, final draft of the accreditation report, which had a due date. And the due date was the day my second daughter was due to be delivered. <laughs> so, you know, as we do, we do often, you know, have to take care of other parts of our lives. And, and so I remember well leaving the CD, it was a CD at the time with my graduate assistant, my husband and I going to the, the you know, the, the hospital and my little uh, Marie was born that night. And so two months later, I start this new job. And another piece of the story comes in. A colleague of mine brings in a new faculty member. who couldn't believe that the new associate dean was in there. I brought my daughter in for a reception in the holidays with a young child, with a baby. How could that be? Women aren't supposed to have families if they're gonna be successful. And I think this is something that's really important, again, as we become leaders, to think about the kind of climate we create for others so that they can have a pathway to find balance and to be their total self in their job. And I think that's really the key. So I went to the Associate Dean job. I did that for five years. I still hadn't achieved that full professorship. That was still gnawing at me. So I'm still the only Associate Dean there who actually got a eight month research leave um, because I said, you know, I need a research leave or I'm going to go back to the faculty because I knew I had to do that. And again, taking ownership of your own career and making decisions that will lead you to where you want to go more long term. 
And I wasn't thinking presidency. I was just thinking by that time, deanship. That was something I really wanted. Um, I was fortunate um, that my husband was um, movable at that time. He was an academic, but he was at a point in his career where he was able to make a change. And so we, we did this together. It was really a family decision. My kids were at the right age. Another factor that we, it, it was a family decision. And we had to think about all of those things. Back to Jenny's point about her son being in college. My kids were 10 and five. So one was finishing elementary school and one was just starting. And so it was a good time to make that transition. And that's when I went East, became Dean at Montclair State University. I was there for three years. I thought I would be there for much longer, but things that happened there, it was fine. I was fine, but I thought, you know, this isn't, this is not getting the support I really thought I needed. And, and yet I was gonna live through that. And a mentor of mine calls me, another mentor. And he says, there's this job at Lehman College. I think you'd be great for it. The provost who's there is taking my job because I'm retiring. And you know, he said, I'm gonna nominate you. You should take that job. I said, am I ready? Because at that point, it's always this question. Women ask the question, are we ready? And you're much more ready than you think. By the way, men tend to always think they're ready and they jump right in into the pool. Good for them, that's not a criticism, but we think we have to hit every bullet on a job description. Nobody hits every bullet on the job description. Let me just tell you that. People who write those want, you know, they want perfection. Nobody's that way, you know? So you just have to feel that it's the right move. You are more ready than you think and you don't need to be invited in. But women tend to want to be invited in. So he invited me into that and I applied and for whatever reason, you know, I was hired. Um, it was an amazing experience. That's where I met Tomas and that was um, incredible. I worked for an incredible president and the question he asked me when he interviewed me was, do you want to be a president? And I thought to myself, is this a trick question? Is he trying to find out if I'm actually going to stay, if I'm going to leave, if I'm using the job? So I actually didn't know what to say. And I paused for a moment. And he said, I said, well, you know, I'm maybe future, but I'm really committed to doing this now. I'm looking forward to being provost. And he said, no, 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 I know that. He said, I want to help you. He said, if that's your aspiration, and you should think about that. And he was an amazing mentor. He was such a, you know, he was committed to creating pathways, um, you know, for people to achieve their aspirations. And he was incredibly supportive of me along the way. So I've been really fortunate to have had these incredible mentors. And in my case, most of them were men who, who really helped me make those transitions. And he said, I'm gonna teach you everything. So we had everything we did, we, we talked about together. And he you know, introduced me to things, he helped me think about things, and it was really important. And when I was um, encouraged to put my name in for president of um, Southern Connecticut State University, so I'm one of those second time presidents now, you know, and I, and I went to New Haven and I, I did that. And then the opportunity came to come back to California where my family is to San Jose. And it was an easy, it was an easy path to take. So it was, the, the message here is this, you don't always know what the path is going to be. I didn't think I was going to start out in Southern California and end up in Michigan and then end up in the East coast where everybody still thinks I'm a New Yorker and I have to explain to them that I'm really a Valley girl from Southern California. Nobody believes it, but it's, you know, you, you, um, those, those, those opportunities are there. They come when they come, not when you want them to come. And the key is not to be afraid of them when they come, to recognize what they are. And for some of us, that means moving and taking new responsibilities. For others of us, it means staying where we are and perhaps taking new responsibilities within our institution. There's no right way or better way. What's right is what works for you, what gives you a chance to have that balance in life, but also to fulfill yourself, to fulfill your potential, uh, to try new things. You can have five careers in the same institution. And so there are so many ways. There's no one way, there's no right way. So this idea that opportunity comes when it comes is really important. I wanted to share that. The other thing I wanted to share is I learned along the way, up until the point I became provost, I really needed to kind of test what I thought 
with other people. I kept saying, am I doing this? Is this the right way? So I would call a mentor and I'd say, is this the right way? Once I became provost, I began to realize that I actually had intuited, I, it'd become part of me by going through all of those conversations with other people. And so now it was a matter of reaching out to colleagues and just working through any strategic problem because we always need to do it. I do that to this day. I'll reach out to colleagues and say, I'm facing this. You know, I could use some perspective. This is what I'm thinking. What have you faced? We continue to learn from each other. So this concept of, of lifelong learning has to be with us, even in these roles that we have. So the other piece I wanted to share is that we, we have to be a little bit humble in what we do. We can only do the work we can do. We're one person. And we don't need to think about doing everybody's work. I think Jenny sort of intuited this as well. That, that it really is about that team. It really is about empowering others, respecting others. And that means recognizing that we have to create as a leader that shared vision and goals, but then really give people space to figure out how they want to get there. Um, oftentimes their way is, is um, even more effective than what I might have come up with. The one thing I ask of my team is to all be on the same page when we're out in public. Let's argue it out. Let's debate it. Let's have all of those, um, but let people, you know, chart their path to solve a problem, and then we hold each other accountable ultimately toward a goal. And that's really, really the key. Um, so this is this is really important, I think. Another piece of advice I'll give you is you've got to be your authentic self. You can't be somebody else's self, and that means don't be afraid to be who you are. I'm a Renaissance literature professor. So I'm always talking about Dunn and Milton. This is what I do. And so I remember when I was president at Southern Connecticut and we hired a new Dean of Education and he leaned over to my then chief of staff and said, I was in a, some kind of faculty president sort of question and answer, um, open forum sort of thing. And he leans over to my chief of staff and says, do we always talk about Dunn and Milton in these things? Uh, and I said, no, because I, a lot of my leadership, a lot of the way I think about things comes from my own academic experience. Each of yours will come from your academic experience, whatever it might be. And you have to be authentic to that. You can't try to be something else. Now that I'm in an administrative position, for example, do I forget that I was an academic who was brought to this profession through you know, my love of learning, my love of literature, my love of sharing that with students? My love of seeing students kind of develop as they engage with ideas. That's all part of who I am. So why shouldn't that be a part of my leadership? Um, I will share that when I came to San Jose State, um, I, I got a lot of weird questions like, why is the, the school in Silicon Valley hiring this English professor? And, uh, and so, you know, again, you know, knowing who you are. And I said, well, you know, I don't know, ask them for one thing. And, and number two, because um, I think it's about really innovation and it's about thinking creatively and it's about creating space for all ideas um, to come together. And, um, and so I think that's really important. And, and the other piece is to understand your role in things. As a traditional academic, and I think colleagues in the College of Business probably have less of this, but let me tell you, your humanist colleagues, they tend to think that, you know, administration is wearing the, the scarlet A. Um, it's really a problem. You can't use the words like efficient. You can't talk about higher education as a business. So going on to the administration is going into the dark side. I, as I say, I think my business colleagues are more sanguine about that because you tend to live more in those, in that sort of, um, that world. Um, and so I had to overcome that prejudice. I had to overcome myself and persuade myself that this was okay to do. And it was colleagues of mine who helped encourage me in that way. Because I, I saw that in myself, I also had that own implicit bias for myself. Was I giving something up? Was I giving up my values? And I think what I've learned along the way is that as long as you straight, stay true to your core values, your integrity, your respect for others, um, your commitment to kind of transparency, honesty, and truth to true inclusion. If you stay true to all of that and you see what you're doing, not as something for yourself, but really as something where you can have an impact um, that's even more, you know, that's greater, that affects more lives, that opens up more opportunities. Um, there's something really rewarding in, in that. 
and and um, and so that that's where I, I try to go. We have hard days. Look, as as leaders, as presidents, um, you know, I guarantee you, we have really hard days. If it's a hard problem, it's going to come to us because anything that's not hard, somebody's already addressed. And and so that's just the nature of the job. You accept it, but you don't personalize it, even if it is personalized at you. Because it's really not about you personally, it's about you in the position. And we have to be able to find that balance. And I always say the best way to do that is to have a life outside of the university, outside of your institution. I, I said it in an interview once, it was for a job I didn't get, um, Tomas, you'll remember that one. And I, I said, um, you, you can't get your love at the university. You've got to get your love somewhere else out there, wherever it is, whether it's a significant other or it might be each of us has that expressed in different ways because if we try to get it at the university uh, or in a job then we're going to make decisions to please people as opposed to making decisions for the right reasons and i think it's really important to do that and then the final thing i would say is that um it's really important to have fun i know jenny said that um, I always say, people would say, well, are you having fun? It's such a hard job, you know, it's, you're dealing with such difficult problems right now. You're being attacked, all this. And I said, look, I said, some days are hard, but if I'm not having fun in the job as a whole, I'll go do something else. My identity isn't wrapped up in the job. It's my commitment to do something that makes a difference and creates opportunities for students and has an impact in our community. And um, as long as I can have fun doing that, then, you know, it's, it's an incredibly rewarding thing. And I will say this, and I'll, I'll just end with this. We don't talk as women enough about the fun and the reward of the work that we do. We talk a lot about all the hard work because women are really good at that. But you know what? There's a lot of reward. And some of it comes in seeing other people thrive and seeing the impact that you have. Um, and uh, it's, um, you know, that's what, uh, that's what keeps me going through all the, the challenging times. And I'll, I'll stop there, Victoria, and, uh, and turn it over. Wow. That was so inspirational, the, you know, you and Dr. Derek, just so much inspiration. I knew it. It's just wonderful. Thank you so very, 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 very much. I really, really appreciate it. We all appreciate it. And thank you. Um, <clears throat> appreciate it. Our next uh, panelist is Dr. Astrid Shield. She is the Dean of the School of Business, Shenandoah University in Virginia. And Dr. Shield joined uh, Shenandoah as the new Dean of the School of Business on July 1, 2019. She is the sixth Dean of the School of Business, and most importantly, the first woman to serve in the role. She was previously the Dean's Fellow for Program Outreach and Promotion and a tenure profession, uh, professor of communication and business at Cal State San Bernardino. She brings more than 25 years of business and academic experience to the position of Dean. She received her BS in Foreign Service from Georgetown University, MS in Communication from the University of Tennessee, and a PhD in Organizational Communication also from the University of Tennessee. Dr. Shield, welcome. Thank you, it's nice to be home. It's nice to be home and to see uh, my California friends. And Jenny, I knew you in California, so you're in that as well. And Mary, Mary, I, I almost, the whole time you were talking, Mary, thank goodness my, uh, my microphone was on. I was like, yes, yes, yes. Write it down, ladies, write it down. So I'm going to take this in a, a little different direction because here you started with two academic stars. I mean, really. They are academic stars. I never consider myself an academic star um, because this is not where I started. Uh, where I started was, um, I didn't know where I started. I went to uh, foreign service. I loved uh, the diplomatic corps. Then I did an internship at the State Department and thought, I'm going to die if I go into the State Department. It was a little misogynistic back then. It was just, uh, I, I couldn't believe that it was 
the kind of play. I couldn't live there. So I sort of went off and went to find myself. Uh, Jenny, you talked about the, uh, the terrible 20s or looking for yourself in your 20s. Well, let me tell you, in my 20s, I had 11 jobs in 10 years and I was fired twice. That's what you call looking for yourself and looking really hard. Now, it didn't mean that I wasn't smart. It didn't mean that I just couldn't get connected. And it, and it wasn't like I had a job for a year and then got fired or a year and then moved on. I had a job for almost three years uh, and, and then other jobs where I, I lasted four months. And some of those granted were, you know, starting off as a, as a waitress and a disc jockey and a this and a that, uh, and finally connecting into business. And in business, I found that, especially when I got into my early 30s, that I had a lot of energy and a lot to offer. And, and it came from my ability to want to be with people. And, and, and not everybody does that. I, I'm, I'm quite the introvert, but, but when, it, when it was time to talk to people, I always wanted to talk. That's all I'm gonna tell you is I wanted to talk. So I started off actually working for Fortune 500 companies. Um, and they hired me in, of all things, public relations. And here's the thing that's incredible, is I never took a public relations course in my life. So I was in PR at uh, Georgia Pacific. And then after a couple of years, I got hired away by a company in Tennessee, another paper company. And I went there and I did public relations for them for six years. And it was only because the market changed that I got downsized. And it gave me an opportunity to go finish my master's degree. Uh, I had two kids, we were living in Tennessee. So I went to the University of Tennessee and I got very excited because I thought, all right, I'm gonna go on for my PhD. And the minute I said that, the minute I said that, it was like this bolt of lightning. It was like, <laughs> and, and, and a, and a headhunter calls and said, you know, there's this company, it's an international company. It's based in Helsinki, Finland, but they've got a beachhead. They've got a company down in Savannah, Georgia. As I was to learn, it was Savannah, Georgia. Uh, and they are looking for you. They are looking for you. And it's because I had done all this crisis communication for the, the company in Tennessee. Uh, so I cut my teeth on crisis communication. Uh, and I'll just tell you just a, a real brief story about that. I'd been working for this company called Bowwater, a paper company. They had hired me to do PR and I wasn't even there three months. Uh, and I kind of got pneumonia from oak pollen. So I was home in bed sound asleep and at four o'clock one afternoon my phone rang and it was the president of the company and he said I know you're sick you're going to have to get out of bed and you're going to have to come here he said I've got 80 reporters in the lobby and I don't know what to tell them and I thought I thought I was hallucinating because I had just kicked back some NyQuil and I thought okay I got in the car got dressed went and it turned out that there'd been this terrible accident on I-75, north and south, and over 100 people had been in car accidents. And all of a sudden, I was going to do the press conference for this company, and I'd only been there less than three months, and I was sick as a dog. And so I got some people in the room, I asked a lot of questions like a journalist would, so I could answer truthfully. And then I went to the bank of microphones and it was like something out of the movies, you know, the ging, 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 you know, all that stuff. And I made my, my pitch. What was interesting at that moment is that the CEO of the company, a, a very elegant gentleman by the name of Anthony Gammy, 
was sitting in his living room with his cigarette and his cocktail, watching me defend his company on CNN and wondered who the hell that kid was defending his company on CNN. And the next day I was on a plane to New York. And then I was put through all of this training, intense training with Hill and Knowlton and these big PR companies to defend uh, this company. And I was quoted something like 285 times in newspapers around the world. It was, a, it was a really, it was the worst accident in the history of the state of Tennessee. And it was a, it was a very sad situation. But, but the point I'm making with all of this is that I wasn't ready for that. And it came to me and I had to take my NyQuil and stand up and do it. So then I get hired by this other company that I, that, um, you know, Bowwater, when I was at Bowwater, they loved me and I got a promotion, a raise and downsized all within three weeks, a promotion, a raise and, a, and downsized. And, and the president came to me and, or actually I went to him, I beg your pardon. And he said, it's time to make some lemonade. He said, this is not about you. It's that they're going to centralize everything in South Carolina. He said, I've decided to retire. We're not going to be our own independent place anymore. We are going to, everything's going to be centralized. Accounting, PR, every, everything is going to be in South Carolina. And so he said, but I'm going to give you part of your salary, a good portion of your salary, so that you can go finish that master's degree that you've been working on, that you've been picking at for like five years. And that's what I did. I went back and I just went up the road uh, and went to Tennessee and finished out my, uh, my uh, master's degree. Then I applied to the PhD program, got accepted, and then the phone rang and off I went to Savannah, Georgia. And I went there as the director of communication. And within a year, the president came and he took me out to lunch and he pushed this piece of paper across the table at me and he said, I want you to take over all of HR. And I looked at her, <laughs> what? And I pushed it right back and I said, no, you don't. And he said, oh, yes, I do. And I said, oh, no, you don't. And he said, yes, I do. And I said, I don't know anything about HR. And he said, don't worry, I'll send you to school. You'll be fine. And so the very first thing is they made me head of HR for this company based in Helsinki, Finland. And we had eight unions. And all of a sudden, I was going to do union negotiations. And so they sent me to Cornell University in New York for six weeks where I learned how to do, I learned how to do it. And then I came back and I was a fabulously terrible uh, negotiator because this is how I negotiated. I said, gentlemen, hi, listen, I don't know what it's gonna take, but we really need random drug testing. We're a chemical company. What do you want? You don't want people running around getting crazy, do you? So whatever you want, let me know. But can we get this done? And we got it done in three months. And people were shocked because it was just like Mary said, you got to take yourself with you. You got to take yourself with you, right? And so I did that for a, a period of time. And then as Mary and Jenny have both said, I was doing a lot of traveling international travel with uh, the, the company based in Helsinki, right? I mean, I was in Savannah, but I was secretary to the board of directors. I was traveling around um, to Rotterdam, to Brussels, even got to go to Moscow. It was very exciting, but I have twins. I have a boy and a girl, uh, they're now adults, but they were also at the age of 12 and 13. And boy, did we, hit a wall. And uh, what I realized, I was a single mom. And uh, one night in Helsinki, I was in the corporate apartment and my daughter was making her cotillion. 
<laughs> she was making her first Southern dance, but a neighbor had come over to get Maddie dressed and put on her makeup. And, uh, and I got to see pictures. And I remember sitting in the hotel room and it was like being struck by lightning. And I went back to Savannah and I, and I thought, I can't do this right now. I can't do this right now. And so I went to the CEO of the company in Helsinki and I told him, I said, I love my work. I love this company but I can either be this wonderful corporate maven or I can be mom. I just can't be both at the same time. And they were so generous that, I mean, he really, I mean, they really wanted me to say, and I just said, I, I can't do it right now. I've got to do something else. And they gave me this incredible off ramp of a year's salary and benefits. And it allowed me to call the University of Tennessee and to say to the University of Tennessee, you know, five years ago, you accepted me to the PhD program. What would it take to kickstart my application? And the dean said, we're having a meeting this afternoon. Let me ask the faculty and I'll call you tomorrow. He called me back the next day and he said, Astrid, we always wanted you to get your PhD here. Come on home. So if you ever want to know what, what angels look like, it's when you make a decision and then the universe comes around and supports you. So not only did I make this incredibly hard decision that I had, I had to get off the fast track, but the second decision was that my company supported me. The third decision was the university wanted me back. And the fourth decision was that my house in Savannah, Georgia, which was at the end of a dirt road and was pretty much a cabin, sold for $40,000 more than I put it on the market within 24 hours. And at that point, I was going, all right, don't push, God, I, I, I'm getting the message here. You want me to leave Savannah now and go back. And that's what I did. And I remember I went, here I was, I was 40 years old. And I went from a six figure salary to making $800 a month as a, as a graduate teaching assistant. I was the oldest graduate teaching assistant in North America. I was so old that they gave me a graduate assistant for my class. I taught 160 students in public relations, you know, and we'd get into the book and I go, okay, that's not how it works. Let me tell you, let me tell you some stories. And this is how we did this is, is I taught from that well of knowledge and yeah, a little bit about the book, but really about where are you going with this? Because I would look at students, I say, okay, you don't want to be a professor. I'm cool with that. What do you want to be? What are you thinking about? How are you going to get there? And, and that kind of, that's what made me stay because it certainly wasn't the money. It was the, the lights go on. The, everybody gets excited. And, you know, five years later, an email or a letter arrives saying, remember when you said this in class? I didn't believe you. Now it's happened. And I'm like, Oh my God, she was right. And you're like, oh, stop, stop. You're killing me. I'm loving it. And, and that was so exciting to me. And then on a plane, I am not making this story up. I graduate. I graduate from the University of Tennessee. Maddie and Peter are up in the balcony doing the wave, which is incredible to have your own kids do that. And I couldn't get a job. Nobody was hiring, but a company was hiring. And I went and I did some work and I kept saying, no, I really wanna be a professor. And finally, Northern Arizona called like seven months later and I could hear people in the background. And the guy goes, hold on, hold on, shut up. He goes, uh, hi, I'm calling from Northern Arizona. And we want to know, are you still interested in that job teaching PR? And I said, yes. 
And he said, it's $44,000 a year. And I said, okay. I said, I really want to do this. Now, let me tell you, in, when people talk about career paths, going, 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 mine went up, down, up, down. And every down was a reinvention moment. Not because I wanted to reinvent, because that's what was in my face. I didn't have a choice. And so many of us are in that position. You, if you don't have a choice, go ahead and boo-hoo, cry your eyes out. I can't even tell you how many nights I cry. And then I would cry and I go, <laughs> okay, that's enough. Well, what do I got to do next? All right, I, I got kids to feed. I got things to do. We got to move this forward. And so when I finally got into teaching, I loved it. And then on a plane going to Chicago to present a paper, I met a professor from Cal State, San Bernardino. And she was asking me about my background. And by the time the plane landed in Chicago, she said, oh my God. She said, I'm Mary. I'm chair of the search committee and we have been looking for you for two years. Do you have a resume? And I said, no, I wasn't looking for a job. And she said, here's my card. And she said, send me your resume after, after Thanksgiving. And I did. And Cal State brought me out. They interviewed me. I went back to Arizona. I was packed and gone. It was kind of, I, I swear there are people in Flagstaff saying, you know, I haven't seen Astrid in a while. I wonder where she went. I mean, it was like you all just whoop, picked me up. I get to California uh, and guess what? Before I even start, we have now hit the recession of 2008, 2009. So I have negotiated a salary and before I get my first paycheck, I got a 10% pay cut. And I have two kids in college, right? So this is life, up, down, up, down, up, down. I get through it, we keep going, we keep going. And then I, I move through the progression. I'm doing things that are, are important to me with students. I love what I'm doing. But then because of all of that business background, those years I spent working for those Fortune 500 companies, it's not that I'm getting bored, it's I'm getting restless. I'm getting restless. And I, I've done everything in arts and letters that I, that I think I can do and I wanna do. And I went to Tomas and basically said, you know, you gotta find me something, I'm, I'm bored. I, I mean, I just, I was, I was bored, not, not with students, not with what I was doing, but give me, just, just pour something on. I need something else to do. And uh, so I got a call from the provost at the time and he was giggling. And he said, well, we've got an idea for you. And, uh, and Larry Rose will be calling you. And so Larry knocked on my door and I don't know if Larry remembers this, but he shows up in his driving cap with some flowers. And I remember opening my door and thinking, oh, are we going to court here? You know? <laughs> and he came in and we started talking about, um, he needed someone to help him in accounting and finance. And after we talked for a while, I was very honest and said, I don't balance my checkbook. And he said, don't worry about that. That's not gonna be important. And so I took it on. I didn't have training. I didn't have a background. I did it. And I did it well. Not always. I'm, I'm gonna be perfect on, honest about this. It was, it's a hard job. I had some tough hombres in that group. 
and they were and they were hard on me and they tested me a lot but larry stood by me he stood right next to me and so when the opportunity came to to try for an ACE fellows program it was like i found the the hidden doorway to where i thought i needed to go which was into administration and i spent a year i worked at chapman university i got to do a lot of traveling it was a phenomenal experience and then i came back uh, to cal state and you know just full of it i mean i like da, 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 da. i am bringing you the tablets from on the mount i have talked to god and i know where we're going and everybody at cal state's like yeah what was your name that uh, face is familiar right and all of a sudden you go Ooh, okay back to my place but tomas and larry said we want you to we want you to take a look at uh, fundraising again no experience no background got into it it was hard it was difficult because the person who was going to be working with me two weeks after I started and she was going to lead me through it. She was the assistant. She got her dream job uh, at a community college. So it was a long year and a half, but I learned a lot. I wasn't invited back to do it, which was, which hurt. I won't tell you it didn't, but I learned a lot. I really got something out of it. And actually what I learned was there's another door for me. There's another door. I know it. And, and not being religious about stuff, but spiritual. I thought, universe, you didn't put all of this, all of this experience, all of this energy, all of this into me to just let me sit and be. You want me to do something. So let's get going. And that's literally the conversation I had with myself. Now, how many jobs did I apply for? I don't have enough fingers and toes to, uh, to tell you how many rejection letters that I got. Uh, and one of them all the way down to the final two, and then I didn't get it. Uh, and, and, and yeah, those hurt. I won't tell you those don't. But again, I'm a I cry. I just boo hoo. How dare they? <laughs> okay, now what now who am I applying to? What's next? Okay, let's do it. Don't ignore those feelings when you get hurt. That stuff hurts. Let it be there. But then pick it up because no one's coming for you. Right? Your phone's not going to ring. You got to go out and make it ring. And so I applied and I applied and I applied. And Shenandoah University called. They wanted to see me. And so I went. Uh, and I, I was totally myself. I mean, totally myself to the point where I, I won't say I was flippant, but at this point, I had kissed so many frogs. I had like tap danced for the universe. I mean, I had done it all. And I thought, I just got to be me and who I am is natural and funny and I'm just going to show who I am. And then apparently the, the provost told me this later that they started calling my references and I didn't tell my references what to say, but everybody who knew me basically said, well, look, if you want Astrid to come out and like maintain, you got the wrong person. Now, if you want her to come out and shake that tree and make something different, you got the right person. And so it just had to be the right fit. So look at this crazy pat patchwork quilt. I start in foreign service, don't like it. I go into advertising, pretty good, not much room for development. You know, then I try all these different things. Then I get into corporate work. I like it. But then I got, get laid off and then I go back to school and then I start as a professor and I rebuild from the top of corporate all the way down, like you, Jenny, 
to assistant professor starting over, starting over, starting over, starting over, right? Up and down, up and down. I started in arts and letters. I was, uh, I was, uh, you know, I, I got my tenure in arts and letters and then I went over to the business school and freaked everybody out. People don't do that. You're not supposed to do that. You can't go there. We can't do this. You can't be in the business school. You're in arts and letters. I'm like, why? That's not the way the world works. And so when I got hired as the dean of a business school, that freaked everybody out because I don't have a business degree. How about that? But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The last thing I'm going to tell you is this. There's something that we call the art of the positive action. And that is you manage, number one is you manage your attitude. Yeah, go have a pity party of epic proportions. Do it, bitch moan, do it. And then pick yourself up and get back in the saddle immediately. I lost out on, on two big positions. One was president and one was dean of another school. I was the bridesmaid for both. And my pity party was epic. It was epic. And then I started applying three days later. You're not gonna get me down. This, this is where I wanna go. And people said, well, why don't you wanna be uh, dean of a business school? Uh, of a communication college. I didn't, I wanted to be dean of a business school. I wanted to be dean of a business school. So I managed my attitude and said, I kept saying, okay, you know, it's like that old joke, you know, kid gets a bag of horse manure and goes, yippee, yippee for Christmas. And somebody comes by and goes, why are you so excited about that bag of manure? And the kid says, because there's a horse in here somewhere, right? So manage your attitudes, not just look for opportunities, but take them. If anybody comes to you and says, crack that door, it's a crack in the door. That's all you need is the crack in the door. And every time the door cracked, I put my toe in it. I got in the way. I just did. Now I got a lot of no's, but that's okay. I was looking, I was always looking for the crack in the door. And it makes a difference because once you open that door, then it's like, all right, come on, right? You let everybody else in with you because you know what it feels like to be shut out of, whether it's the old boys club or whatever club it is. It's okay, right? And the third thing. And Mary said this the best, is you take yourself everywhere you go. You know, years ago, when I first graduated from Tennessee, Miami, where you are now, Jenny, I got a call from them and they were so excited. I'd been recommended, a uh, friend put me up. I went up there, uh, I went in and they said, well, you know, what do you teach? And I said, well, I'm kind of a utility infielder because I've been in business. So I'm really good at this and that. I can teach this. I can teach that. My research is kind of all over the place. It's about brain dominance, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and I thought I was, I was going to be a shoe in And the dean called me and said, uh, they don't want you. And I was like, how could they not want me? And he said, well, you frightened them. <laughs> And, and so I, I didn't get to go. And I realized I don't wanna be any place where I frighten people. You know, I don't, that's not me. I love life. I love help, like you talked about, helping students, making things happen. I got to Shenandoah and the first thing I did was I found somebody to mentor. I went to them, scared her a little bit and said, I've got plans for you right? Because I wanted to help somebody. Because it wasn't until I got to Larry and Tomas that I could say I had a mentor. 
Now, my mentors were grandma and mom, but not until I got to Larry and Tomas did I have anyone look at me and say, okay, you're a big weirdo, but we really like you and we're gonna help you. It took a long time. All I can tell you is that I love in this journey. I don't know where it ends. And that's what I want you to understand is that everything you do adds into that bag that you carry with you. It's who you are and it's all that fabulous piece of you. So thank you for letting me share my story with you. Thank you so much, Astrid, yay! That's a fabulous story. We're opening it up for questions. Um, I think that we put it in the chat or something. Yeah, uh, if you have questions, would you please um, please ask? Just want to say how wonderful of uh, information that I got. Three different um, different avenues to approach administration, and three different perspectives. So click on the Q and A at the bottom if you would like to ask a question. Um, Anna Nee mentions, you all mentioned the mentorship you experienced. How are you mentoring? Could you please give us an example how you build up good mentoring relationships with your mentor or mentee? Uh, Victoria, I'm happy to start on that one. Okay. If, um, I, I want to tell a story about when I was associate dean. So I'd been at the university by then, maybe eight, nine years. And I remember there was a new faculty member in one of the departments in the college who came up to me and asked me if I would mentor her. Uh, there was nobody in her department, she felt, because of the demographics of her department. And it was the first time I realized I was in a position where people were now looking at me to mentor as opposed to me looking for the mentors. And it was a really eye-opening moment to realize that mm -hmm. I was in that place and that I had that special responsibility. And so, uh, you know, it, it, um, it really became a part of what I did. And wherever I was, when I would see someone, and I have a, a boy, a, men, a mentee of mine, if you will, um, who is about ready to be announced for a major position, um, and was a faculty member becoming a chair at the time. And I said to this person, you're going to be um, a senior leader one day and really a, a president if that's what you want and I'll help you get there. And this is over now, uh, you know, 10, 12 years. And so we have regular check-ins and I always help um, my colleague think about what's next. You know, if you do this now, think about how that will set you up for what might be next. And, um, you know, to give that support. And I've had this happen now, you know, with multiple people. And so I've got colleagues around the country who will check in with me. I check in with them um, and, and try to encourage them and support them. So for me, it's, it's, it's really the paying it forward piece. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a really, really important part of what we do, helping others to see the potential in them and to support them and thinking through some of the ways uh, that they might achieve what matters to them. I'd like to add to that just real briefly. When I got to Shenandoah, one of my professors, a woman of color, she's been teaching, she's a brilliant woman, uh, about 46. And I went to her and asked her if she was getting into a rut or a little bored. And, and you know, she didn't want it. She thought she, that was a very scary question. But I said, here's why I'm asking is because I see tremendous leadership potential in you and I want to be your mentor. And so I went to her. I can tell you that that's very unusual, uh, male or female. Mary, you were very lucky to have people say, I'm gonna push you along. I had people saying, look out for this one. You know, I had a very different experience. Truly not until I got to Cal State did I have a mentor but in, in, and both Larry and Tomas. But other than that, I can honestly say I had it just the opposite. So for me, it's important. And if you want to be mentored, you need to go ask somebody, like the person that came up to Mary and said, would you mentor me? Go ask them, they will be honored, they will. 
Thank you, Esther. Jenny, did you want to add to that? I think the answers have been brilliant, so I couldn't add any more, so thank you. Well, thank you. I just, uh, the other observation that I had, uh, it's not a question, Ivan says, uh, but I have to say that Astrid's pres uh, presentation was amazingly inspirational. And then Lisa Gordon says, I wish I could think of just one question. The inspiration I feel in my heart has me speechless. Thank you all, Lisa Gordon. And our time is up and I wanna thank everybody for being here. I wanna thank our panelists. You guys are outrageously awesome. And uh, thank you for spending our, your time with me and all of us and for Cal Thanks State. for the invitation. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and before you, let me make an offer to whoever's in the audience. I'm always happy if somebody wants to reach out, mm. uh, feel free to give them my contact information. Thank you, I will. Yeah, Mary, I need a, I'm looking for a new mentor, Mary. Yeah, you always find me. So <laughs> never, never, never hesitate. Thank you. Um, and she means it. She means Kate it. Kate Bella says, I see that leadership for women comes with a lot of sacrifices, challenges, and a lot of risks. So with yeah. that in mind, ladies, let's go forth and change the world. Thank you so much for Thank being here. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Good Leadership in higher education deserves women. So thank you, ladies, for being part of it. Have a great day and have a great year. Thank you. Thanks, Victoria. Bye. Bye. Thank you, ladies.